Hello, beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more about my offerings at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. I also have a Facebook page of the same name, and I have the daily inspiration email blast where you can sign up to receive an inspiring email from me every weekday. And in addition to being an angelic practitioner, I am someone who listens to sleep podcasts, and I have for several years now. They have become a part of my self-care routine. I have a bright and beautiful waking life, and I also love bedtime. I am one of those people who can't wait to go to bed. I go to bed fairly early, usually much earlier than my husband these days. By 8 or 8.30, I am ready for bed. But I also wake up super early. And my routine includes curling up under the covers with lots of pillows. And then I put in my earbuds and I pick an episode of a sleep podcast. There are quite a few that I listen to on a regular basis. And last fall, I started contemplating creating a podcast for you because it felt like we needed more. We needed more sleep podcasts because there's 365 days in a year. And so I wanted lots of options for each day because each day I might want something different than I did the day before. And that's how Sleepy Bedtime Blessings was born. It blends together two of my favorite forms of self-care the angels, and sleep podcasts. So thank you for finding your way here. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you. There are an endless number of ways that you can use this podcast. You can, of course, use it as you get ready to go to sleep. And if you do that, what I recommend is you give it a try for a few nights. It can take a little bit of time to build a relationship with a broadcast like this. And if you give it a few nights try, you might find that as soon as you start hearing my voice and coming into the rhythm of this broadcast, it becomes a signal to your consciousness that it's time to rest. I have also heard from several of you that you use it during the day and that it helps keep you company with whatever you are doing. And however you are listening to this podcast, It is truly a blessing to get to keep you company and spend this time with you. If you're new to the world of angels, 
They are divine celestial beings. They are non-denominational, so as I bring their energy and their love to you, it is independent of any singular religion or spiritual path. I find working with the angels complements many different spiritual paths. They are the embodiment of divine, unconditional, expansive love. And something really wonderful happens when we connect with this love. It is like sunlight to a flower. It helps us to blossom open. And it helps us to remember our divine essence. And so it is truly my joy to come to you here now. I am in the blanket fort. For those of you who don't know what that is, I have this big, cozy, bulky blanket that I throw over my monitor and my head, and I create a blanket fort from which I broadcast to you because it creates this quiet, cozy quality to the sound. So my beautiful friend, I invite you to take some nice deep breaths in and out, just allowing yourself to come into this beautiful sacred space that the angels are co-creating just for you. You see, the thing about the angels is they have the ability to work with you uniquely. So even though there might be many listening to this episode, the energy you receive from it will be calibrated just for you. It is one of the things that I am so fascinated by as I have continued to do this work that somehow the love and the light that is generated by the angels, it's almost as if it refracts through the prism of life to bring to each one of us exactly what we need. So this is our invitation to you to open your heart and allow your angels to bring to you the energy, the light, and the love that will serve your highest and best good. So just take a breath in, allowing your body to relax. Just allowing a wave of relaxation to start at the top of your head, smoothing away any tension that might be in your forehead, taking a breath and just relaxing your jaw, letting this wave of relaxation smooth down your neck. to your shoulders, your upper back, just releasing any tension that you might have within as this calming wave of energy smooths down your torso, smoothing down your arms, just allowing your arms to release and grow heavy Your body has done enough for today and it has permission to drift off into a state of rest. Just allowing this soothing, calming wave of light to help you relax your stomach and your lower back 
allowing this to smooth down your upper thighs, smoothing down your legs to your thighs and your calves to your toes, just allowing your body to let go. That this is your time to rest and your angels are with you and they are filling the room you are in with a soft pink light. This light is infused with energy to help you relax. This light brings to you waves of divine love that has been calibrated for you. That your angels know what is happening in your life right now. They know your deepest prayers and they are here right now to love and support you. And I love calling the angels in, of saying a prayer to invite them in, even though they are already here. But I share this prayer with you so that it comes into your awareness as a reminder that any time of the day or night, you have permission to invite the angels forward for you. So beautiful, beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of divine love that bring forward soothing, calming light for each of our beloveds listening to this broadcast. And angels, I ask, that you help to clear our energy fields of anything that does not belong to us and anything that is not serving our highest and best good. Angels, I ask that you brighten our path with blessings and with inspiration with beloved heart-centered support and community that feels like home. And angels, I ask that you bring in that beautiful essence of home here in 3D world. May each of us have a deep sense of belonging a feeling on purpose in our lives. So dear ones, just take a beautiful breath in and release. And yes, you are here on purpose. You are a blessing in this world. Truly you are. You are one who sees through the heart of love more often than not. It does not mean that you always must be loving 24-7. As my guides love to say to me, we hate to break it to you, but you did not incarnate to be an avatar in this lifetime. It is not expected that you achieve some kind of lofty perfection in your loving of the world. But more often than not, you see the world through eyes of love and compassion. You are one who carries deep empathy in your heart. Just breathe. You are seeding molecules of light 
light and love into the collective consciousness. And you are making a difference. Your life, your beautiful life, makes a difference in this world. So just breathe. And if you have any prayers or intentions that you would like to bring into this sanctuary of light, we invite you to bring them forward. In consciousness, you don't need to speak them aloud, just speak them in your heart. And your angels will receive your prayers and intentions and amplify them in your name. And just breathe and allow yourself to come into the fullness and the wholeness and the brightness of your beingness. You are a big, beautiful soul having a human experience. And in these moments, our hope is that it makes it easier for you to connect with the bigness and the beauty of your divine essence as we endeavor to help you remember the truth of your being. You are born of the breath of God. Through you, God explores the world through your eyes and through your heart through your experiences. You are glorious. You are wondrous. You are a miracle. And it truly is my joy and blessing to share this moment with you. As the angels help you remember the fullness of your spirit. And so take a breath in and release. Feeling the light all around you, helping you remember your way. And you rest. And while you rest, the angels will be with you. And I'm going to read to you. So tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you from another one of my Jewish sisterhood recipe books. So, a little bit of background if this is the first episode of this type that you are listening to. I was raised Jewish in the 60s and 70s. And community cookbooks were widely used to help disseminate recipes within a community. This was before the internet, right before you could just Google what is the best chocolate chip cookie recipe and it, voila, it would be there for you. And so sisterhoods, PTAs, associations would gather up recipes from their community and they would assemble it into usually a spiral bound book. And then they would sell it as a fundraiser. 
and I started becoming obsessed with these community cookbooks. And for me, I'm especially interested in the Jewish ones because of my background. Earlier this year, as I was preparing for the podcast, I'm a foodie. I love food. And I'm also someone who eats really healthy these days. And so I don't cook a lot, but I have this profound joy in reading recipes and imagining them. And so I started collecting because I will share with you, I can be a bit obsessive that when there is something I'm interested in, I will go all in. Then I started purchasing these cookbooks off of eBay. And just so you know, they're super easy to get and they're inexpensive. So whatever your background is, there is likely a series of community cookbooks that are for sale right now. So from the Italian Association, from the Catholic Church, from your city, and it's, it's like a, a touch of home because the thing about these recipe books is these aren't like professional cookbooks. In a professional cookbook, every recipe is tried numerous times. It's tested to make sure that it will always produce the same results, right? So if you pick up one of Julia Child's cookbooks, you know what you're getting. There's a theme. You're going to learn something from her. Well, these community cookbooks, you never know what you're going to get, right? This is, these are not professionally developed recipes. This is, you know, Aunt Joan's potato salad. This is grandma, grandma's cookie recipe. Right, a little pinch of this, a little bit of that, toss in some diet cherry cola, and here's a delicious dish. (laughs) Those are my favorite recipes because they really reflect how I was brought up. Generational cooking, right, where no one really wrote anything down, or maybe they got a recipe off the box of crackers and it got shoved into a folder somewhere, and there would be some handwritten notes on however your mom or grandma changed the recipe. So we're going to wander through some of these recipes in this episode. And I don't know about you, but my heart is so happy. I got this book a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh, I can't wait to share it with you. (laughs) So this one is called Eat, Darling, and Enjoy. (laughs) Is that not a great title? Just like some booby, some aunt. Eat, darling, and enjoy, right? This is such a beautiful invitation. And this is a Jewish cookbook of kosher recipes compiled by Beth Israel Sisterhood in Flint, Michigan. It was published in 1979. And I'll read to you the foreword. The women write, This publication represents a generous sharing of the favorite tried and true, though not necessarily original, recipes of the many people whose names appear throughout. They are the heart of this book, and we should like to express our deepest appreciation to them for making it possible. The committee members, in turn, spent many long hours reading, rereading, typing, organizing, and clarifying recipes, trying to make certain they were all written as accurately as possible in a fashion even the newest cook should be able to follow successfully. Hopefully few errors have slipped past them. 
We thank these women who have made this book a reality. You will find the recipes contained herein to be as varied and interesting, traditional and contemporary as the contributors themselves. There is something for every taste and need, basic traditional foods we remember our mothers making, foreign dishes, vegetarian dishes, healthy low-calorie dishes, and fun fattening dishes. There are quick and easy things as well as long involved ones for both family and guests. And this is signed by Judy Beisman, the chairman, Esther Feinberg, co-chairman, Janet S. Burke, co-chairman, and Yetta Osher, co-chairman. So I will share with you that I have a strategy when I get a new recipe book like this one. I go right to the Kugel recipes. So for those of you who don't know, Kugel is a word that encompasses sweet and savory dishes that are typically made in a casserole form or a pudding form. The most popular Kugel usually is a sweet Kugel that involves egg noodles, and some kind of dairy. In mine, I use cottage cheese and sour cream. There's sugar. In mine, there's golden raisins. And it is a delicious dish and very iconic in Jewish households. For me, a kugel always represented a special occasion. You didn't have kugel every day. You had it because it was Shabbat or the Sabbath. You had it because it was a holiday. And so, as I've shared with you, I have another episode somewhere in the archives for the love of Kugel or the ode to Kugel where I share with you my famous Kugel recipe. And I'll also share it with you here so you don't have to try and go back and look for it. So my recipe starts with a pound of egg noodles. And you cook up the egg noodles. And typically you cook them a little al dente because they're going to cook again when you put them in the casserole. And my recipe calls for four eggs, one cup of sugar, two cups of cottage cheese, two cups of sour cream, one and a half sticks of butter, one tablespoon of cinnamon, one teaspoon of salt, and two cups of golden raisins. And then you bake that at 350 degrees for 45 minutes. And it is delicious. And you know, I will share with you, I haven't I hadn't made this in a really long time, many, many years, because my husband doesn't care for it. And I don't want to make a full pan of kugel for myself because I would eat it. (laughs) When I used to go visit my mom while she was still alive, there is a Jewish deli called Kaufman's in Skokie, and it's so good. And I would go there and I would get a little bit of all my favorite dishes, including a piece of noodle kugel that I would savor, but it wasn't as good as my own. So at the end of June and early July, my sister had come out to California for a visit and she brought two of her three kids and her oldest son, who's in grad school, has taken up cooking He's enjoying learning how to make different dishes. And so my sister asked me if I would teach him how to make kugel. And I said, of course. So we went to our cousin's house and together we made kugel. We actually made two kugels. One was the regular kugel and the other had gluten-free egg noodles for a cousin who doesn't eat gluten. And it was so lovely 
the house smelled <laughs> like kugel. And we sat outside and we all ate kugel together. And it was, there was such a warmth and a continuity and a joy and the experience. So I'm really lucky. I recently have had kugel and it was good. <laughs> so if you're looking to try a different dish that maybe you haven't had before, um, or maybe you'd make kugel, maybe you'll have an opportunity to make one for some people you love. But I'm going to share with you some kugel recipes and some other recipes from this recipe book from the women of Beth Israel in Flint, Michigan. Okay, so this first one, Okay, before I tell you about it, let me read to you the ingredients. And if you are awake and tracking, just notice if, if something seems a bit off about this recipe. Not off, that's the wrong word. If something seems a little different about this recipe. Five pounds of broad noodles. Eighteen eggs. Five cups of sugar two and a half teaspoons of salt, eight lemons, juice, and rind, or one cup of lemon juice. Are you getting this all of a sudden, that this is a massive, a massive batch of Google? One pound of butter, ten oranges, juice, and rind, or three cans of six and a half ounce each frozen orange juice. Do people still buy orange juice in cans? I know that was a big deal when I was growing up. I, I can't remember seeing frozen orange juice lately. Not that I look, but just, I don't know. Okay, I digress. Four, no, four cups of white raisins. Five teaspoons of baking powder. Five cans, 20 ounces each, of apples for pies. And as I was reading this recipe, I was like, what is happening here? And it says it serves 100. So I don't know if any of you watch a lot of TikToks. I somehow found my way to TikTok <laughs> during the pandemic and... I don't know. I love watching it. And one day I found my way onto Lunch Lady TikTok. <laughs> and it's different lunch ladies. And I'm sure there's lunch men too. It's just the vernacular here in the U.S. We call them lunch ladies. I'm sure we don't call them men that. I'm just, it's usually there's this, I don't know, I get this vision of a woman in a hairnet. And when I went to school, it was always the lunch ladies. And they cook up massive batches of whatever it is. And so one of the women I follow, she makes amazing things for her kids. She makes, you know, butter chicken, which is an Indian dish and all kinds of cool foods, but they're huge amounts. And when I saw this recipe, I was like, this is lunch lady TikTok for Kugel. I don't know why that really delighted me. But let me go ahead and give you the rest of the recipe in case you do want to make this for 100 people. And I should add, this recipe is brought to us by Leah Wolin. So she says, melt butter and sugar, beat until frothy, add one egg at a time, add juice and raisins and dry ingredients, mix well with noodles, grease eight large pans, add mixture, bake at 350 degrees for one hour, can be frozen before or after baking, bring to room temperature before baking or reheating, can be divided into smaller amounts. You know, um, I know here, well, probably in a lot of places, if you had the fundraisers, the spaghetti dinners, or the crab feeds. This could be a kugel festival for your temple, right? Making 
trays of kugel for everybody. I would buy one for sure. Okay, let me find some other awesome kugel recipes. Okay, I find this one interesting. I've never heard of a recipe like this before. This is wine noodle kugel. So it has wine in it. So it's one pound of white egg noodles cooked and drained, three eggs, three tablespoons of raisins, four tablespoons of sugar, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, a 15 ounce can of applesauce, and a half a cup of wine. Mix all ingredients together. Bake in a well-greased pan and 9 by 13 for 45 minutes at 350 degrees. And bake until brown from Lillian Whitcow. Now, here's what's interesting. Notice how they don't tell you what kind of wine. But in a Jewish household, you would just have the kosher grape wine, right? You would have just this normal I don't know, this is 1978 Manischewitz wine. You know, in, in, Ju- in Judaism, at least the Jewish households I knew about, at the time we weren't into fine wines. There would be a bottle of Manischewitz that you would use on the Shabbos, and some of it would go into the Kogel. So usually this would be a sweet grape wine. I just thought that was interesting. And then there's another recipe that has pineapple in it. So often pineapple would be put into kugel. And this one also has a cornflake crumb topping, which again was rather common. So this is from Charlotte Castle. It's one package of 10 ounce noodles, three eggs beaten, a half a cup of sugar, a pint of sour cream, one small can of crushed pineapple drained, a quarter pound of butter, melted, one teaspoon of vanilla, and then cornflake crumbs. So you mix everything together, and then you top it very lightly with crumbs. Again, it's being baked for an hour at 350 degrees. And then some of the kugel recipes are savory, I'm, I love this one because I love the title. It's potato kugelettes, so little mini potato kugels. So this calls for four medium potatoes, one small grated onion, four eggs, one teaspoon of salt, eight tablespoons of chicken fat or a quarter pound of butter, I know it sounds kind of gross in our modern age to put chicken fat into something, but a lot of Jewish dishes back then, you saved the chicken fat. It's it's sort of how um, non-Jews might use pork fat, and in it's called schmaltz. It it would be chicken schmaltz. It would be schmaltz. Everyone would know that the schmaltz was chicken. Um, and it gave an, actually a really delicious flavor to everything. So my apology to my vegetarians, but that was, that was what it was in the day. So here's how we make it. So again, if I were making this now, of course, I would use butter. And if I was cooking for vegans, I would use um, some other form of oil. So grate potatoes and drain off part of liquid. Add grated onions, well-beaten eggs, salt, and melted fat or butter. Stir well. Put in well-greased muffin tins and bake at 350 for one hour. Mix 12 large muffins. This recipe will make six to seven dozen miniatures. To freeze, put on a cookie sheet until frozen, then seal in plastic bags. When ready to use, do not defrost. Bake at 400 degrees until heated. For potato pancakes, use the same recipe, eliminating the fat. This is from Grace Katz. And this is another savory kugel, a zucchini kugel. 
So two pounds of zucchini sliced, one medium onion grated, two eggs, quarter cup of matzo meal, one and a half teaspoons of salt, a half a teaspoon of pepper. Cook zucchini in a little water until soft, strain liquid off, and then add all other ingredients. Put in a well-greased 8x10 casserole and bake at 375. And this is by Mary Safer. And this is another sweet kugel. This is Apple Kugel by Laura Livingston. Six large tart firm apples. Half a cup of flour. Half a teaspoon of baking powder. A pinch of salt three tablespoons of butter or margarine, half a cup of sugar, half a cup of water, three eggs, two tablespoons of lemon juice, and half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Pair apples, then slice them very thin on the coarse side of a hand grater. Sprinkle with lemon juice, toss, and set aside. Beat eggs well. Add in order of mixing well after each sugar, water, butter, sifted dry ingredients. Fold in apple slices and transfer to buttered two-quart casserole. Sprinkle top with a mixture of additional sugar and cinnamon. Bake at 350 degrees for about an hour or until browned somewhat and apples are done. A knife will easily go through. Serve hot. Can be frozen after baking. Bring to room temperature and reheat in a 350 degree oven for 20 to 25 minutes. Well, that sounds good. And then so not as to overwhelm you with kugel options, we're going to move over to the desserts. Because who does not like a good dessert recipe from the end? you know, late 1970s. So this one, to me, this really epitomizes how we were eating and thinking about food in the late 70s. This is apple harvest dessert. And in parens, it says locale. So locale and dietetic was really big back then. So this has three medium apples peeled and sliced, half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a dash of nutmeg, two eggs beaten, six packages of sweet and low. And just so we're clear, they're talking about those little paper packages that you would get at a coffee store, right? So not like a giant package with sweet and low, a little bit goes a long way. Those are the pink packages, just in case you wanted to replicate this recipe. Half a teaspoon of salt, a third of a cup of dry milk powder, half a cup of water, eight ounces of cottage cheese, and I'm sure in this case you'd go for non-fat cottage cheese, and one teaspoon of vanilla. Mix apples with three packs of sweetener, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Place in an 8 by 8 baking pan. Bake at 425 degrees for 15 minutes. Combine remaining ingredients well. The use of a blender is better than a mixer. Pour cheese mixture over the apples as soon as apples are removed from the oven. Reduce heat to 325 and bake for 40 minutes. This is by Betty Heindrich. Okay, you know what? I have to say, aside from the sweet and low, this actually kind of sounds good. So I wouldn't use sweet and low these days. I would perhaps use some monk fruit or I actually use honey and maple syrup. I I just don't use refined sugar because it hits me differently. But this kind of sounds good. I I am a cottage cheese person. I do appreciate um, (laughs) it's appreciation, too, too strong a word. 
I don't know, cottage cheese is part of my food repertoire. So I don't know, some variation of that might sound good to me in, on some days. Okay, we'll keep going though. Let me find something else to share with you. Okay, there's actually a recipe here called a sauerkraut chocolate cake. There must be some sort of flavor profile to this that I don't understand or have an appreciation about but it looks like it's a variation on a chocolate cake and includes a half a cup of sauerkraut. So I'm not going to read you the whole recipe because it doesn't sound good to me, but I just think that's interesting. And then there's also a cake here called the salad dressing cake that includes one cup of a mayonnaise-based salad dressing. So it may have been that back then there was a flavor profile for the combination of sweet and savory that I don't quite understand. Okay, there's a couple of cakes here that I'll share with you because I just like the title. This one is called Mary's Good Cake. (laughs) Isn't that a great name? Mary's Good Cake, and it's by Mary Michkin. So, one cup of dates cut up, one teaspoon of soda, baking soda, I'm assuming, one cup of hot water, one and a quarter cup of sugar divided, one cup of butter, two tablespoons of butter, two cups of flour divided, two eggs, one tablespoon of cocoa, one teaspoon of vanilla, one cup of chocolate chips divided, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon and a quarter, I'm sorry, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon. So just make sure if you're writing this down, it's a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon and a quarter teaspoon, I'm sorry, a quarter, (laughs) easy for me to say, a quarter cup of chopped nuts. Mix dates, soda, and hot water. Set aside. Cream one cup of sugar with one cup of butter. Add eggs one and three quarter cup of flour, cocoa, and vanilla. Add date mixture and mix well. Add half a cup of chocolate chips. Pour into a nine by 13 greased pan. Combine a quarter cup of flour, a quarter cup of sugar, cinnamon, and two tablespoons of butter. Sprinkle on top of batter. And then combine a half a cup of chocolate chips and nuts and sprinkle over top of cake. Bake 40 minutes at 350 degrees. Serves 10 or more. So it sounds like you make the base of the cake and then you put in sort of the streusel topping and chocolate chips on top of that. So that kind of sounds good. The other one that I want to share with you is the Las Vegas cake. I just love the title of that, you know, Las Vegas. And think of Las Vegas in the late 70s, you know, it's not what it is now. So I don't know how this became a Las Vegas cake if, I don't know, I have no no insight to that. I just thought that was interesting. And it's from Anita Kippelman. So we have a half a cup plus two tablespoons of butter. Okay, I got it. So half a cup plus two tablespoons of butter, one and a half cups of sugar, three eggs separated, three tablespoons of grated lemon peel, three cups of sifted flour, one teaspoon of soda. Again, I'm assuming that's baking soda. Two teaspoons of baking powder, a quarter teaspoon of salt, one and a half cups of sour cream, one cup of miniature chocolate chips, one cup of chopped walnuts, two tablespoons of orange juice, and two tablespoons of lemon juice. So cream butter and one cup sugar thoroughly. Add egg yolks, one at, so egg yolks, add egg yolks one at a time, so we're separating the eggs. Oh, it says that in the recipe, okay just in case you're following along and you're not asleep yet. We're separating the eggs. Beat well after each addition. Stir in lemon peel. 
Sift together flour, soda, and salt. Add to creamed mixture alternately with sour cream, blending after each addition. Beat egg whites until stiff and fold into batter along with chocolate and nuts. Turn batter into greased and floured tube pan, which I think is also a bunt pan if I'm not mistaken. Bake at 350 degrees for 50 minutes or until done. Turn on the plate, top side up, and baste while hot with sauce made by combining remaining half cup sugar, orange juice, and lemon juice brought to a boil. All right, this one sounds really good, and I will never make it because I don't eat sugar anymore, but I'm going to just enjoy imagining the flavor profile of butterscotch brownies. Yum. Okay, a quarter cup of butter or other shortening. One cup of light brown sugar packed. One egg. Three quarters of a cup of sifted flour. One teaspoon of baking powder. Half a teaspoon of salt. Half a teaspoon of vanilla. And half a cup of chopped nuts. Heat oven to 350 degrees. Melt butter over low heat. Take from heat, blend in sugar, then egg. Sift together flour, baking powder, salt, and stir in. Add vanilla and nuts. Spread in a well-greased and floured square pan, 8 by 8. Bake 20 to 25 minutes, and while warm, cut into 16 squares. To make them extra special, bake them in a shallow greased muffin pans which you fill one-third full, and then top with a scoop of ice cream. Yum, that sounds really good. Okay, wait, we have another locale dish. Locale. (laughs) Just the idea of that brings back so many memories. How many of you remember going to a restaurant, like a diner, and they would have the dietetic dish or the locale dish, and it would be a slice of canned pineapple with cottage cheese, and then a cherry on the top with some sliced tomatoes, like your dietetic dish. Hello, Weight Watchers of the 1970s. So these are butterscotch drops, locale, from Tilly Polakoff. One and a third cup of all-purpose flour, two-thirds of a cup of coconut, one third of a cup of margarine softened, one quarter cup firmly packed brown sugar, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of soda, again baking soda, and then one teaspoon of liquid sweet 10 or two thirds of a cup of sprinkle sweet. So we can assume that some sort of sugar substitute, probably similar to stevia or Truvia, or something. Um, But back then, these sugar substitutes did not have as a good flavor profile as they do now. Um, Two teaspoons of vanilla and two eggs. So preheat oven to 375, lightly grease your cookie sheets. In a large bowl, combine all all ingredients, mix well, drop by teaspoon two inches apart, Bake for 8 to 10 minutes until edges are golden brown and store in the refrigerator. Okay, and now we have a recipe for mandelbrot, which also is known as mandel bread, which is the Jewish version of biscotti. So, um, mandel bread, mandelbrot is like biscotti. So this recipe calls for one cup of oil or one stick of butter. I will, I will say that my mom's recipe called for oil. Um, one and a quarter cups of sugar, four eggs, four cups of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, one teaspoon of salt, one cup of walnuts, optional, or half a cup glazed candied cherries, optional. 
and one teaspoon of vanilla. So you beat first three ingredients until thick and light about five minutes. Add sifted dry ingredients, add nuts, make five rolls, bake 375 degrees about 20 minutes, or until one indented roll jumps back. Slice hot with a serrated knife, Lay slices on side and toast 375 degrees just until it colors. Don't let them get brown. Slices may be dipped in cinnamon sugar on both sides before toasting. And that's how my mom did it. It would get dipped into cinnamon sugar. And you know what? I actually found the Mondel bread recipe my mom would make. So here it is from the cookbook's of Phyllis Bleeden, my mom, one cup of oil, one cup of sugar, four cups of flour, four eggs, two teaspoons of baking powder, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of vanilla, one cup of nuts, and one teaspoon of water. And then it just says bake at 350 degrees for 25 minutes, but I hand wrote this recipe out, so it's inferred that I know what to do from here. As I recall, my mom would use pecans, chopped pecans in her mandel, and you would divide it into logs, and the the dough itself would be kind of oily, so it would be relatively easy to work with. And then, similar to biscotti and what we said in the previous recipe, you cook it for 25 minutes, and then you slice it, and then you toast it some more, and it did involve cinnamon sugar. It was so good. This is definitely a flavor memory for me from my childhood. Again, I wouldn't make it now because I don't eat sugar and it would only be my mom's mandel if it involved pecans and my husband is allergic to them. So, alas, my mandel bread days are over, but I can certainly walk down memory lane with all of you. Okay, and then our last recipe for this episode is going to be ricotta almond strudel because that just sounds so good. So the crust is a quarter pound of melted butter, six strudel leaves, which is phyllo dough, phyllo dough, and half a cup of wheat germ. The filling is two cups of ricotta cheese a half a teaspoon of freshly grated lemon rind, two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice, a quarter cup of honey, a quarter teaspoon of salt, a half, let's say, no, I'm sorry, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, a quarter cup of sliced toasted almonds, a third of a cup of raisins, two eggs beaten, and half a cup of fine breadcrumbs. Combine all filling ingredients. And that was the everything I listed from the two cups of ricotta all the way to the fine breadcrumbs. So the procedure for assembling the strudel. Lay a leaf of the strudel dough or phyllo dough on a cutting board. Butter liberally with pastry brush or fingers. Sprinkle lightly with wheat germ. Add second leaf and repeat this process until all leaves are used. Spread the filling over stacked leaves. Roll up and tuck ends in. Place roll on ungreased cookie sheet seam side down. Brush top with butter. Bake at 375, 375 degrees for 30 to 35 minutes until golden brown. Slice when cool and freeze after baking. And this is from Karen Leitzen. These recipes just sound delicious, except for the sauerkraut cake. I don't quite understand that, but I'm sure it is somebody's joyful food memory, just not part of mine. But I hope 
that this walk down memory lane will invoke some warm and happy memories for you of the foods that your family used to make. But there's certain flavors, some foods, right, that are part of home, that essence and imprint of home. So thank you for letting me share this with you. I really love getting to share these recipes with you. I feel like somehow it invokes um, those who came before us, right? You think of the women of this era, the late 1970s. Back then, women still did the bulk of the cooking. Um, Eating out in restaurants was not an everyday occurrence, so typically they would have to make three meals a day for their families, and it was a different way of life. So I like getting to pay tribute to those who came before us. So perhaps by now you are asleep, and if so, I wish you sweet dreams. If you happen to still be awake and you want some more companionship, there are lots of episodes in the archive so you can queue up another episode I think I may also have enough food-related episodes to make a cool playlist. (laughs) Just a whole four or five hours of Jewish recipes for you. So I send you love. And I am grateful for the opportunity to spend this time with you. I wish you grace. I wish you blessings of light. And we'll talk again soon. I love you. Thank you.